Troubling scenes in northeastern China have many concerned about a second virus outbreak. In one high-risk area, residents are not even allowed outside. A 20-year-old student from Australia shows the world how the Chinese regime tries to control overseas universities. A whistleblower is calling for an investigation into the UN. She accuses the UN of a practice that puts people's lives in danger. Some of their family members were arrested, um, arbitrarily detained, tortured, and in some cases even died in detention. Taiwan's President Tsai Ing-wen sworn in for her second and final term today. She said Taiwan couldn't accept becoming part of China under its one country, two systems offer. Welcome to China In Focus. I'm Tiffany Meyer. A May 19th video shows 100-meter-long lines outside a hospital in the northeastern Chinese city of Xinyang. The person taking the video says everyone registered online before coming. He doesn't say if they're waiting for CCP virus testing or they're just feeling unwell and want to see a doctor. Local media did not report on the story. Another video shows people in protective gear at a primary school in Xinyang. The school is currently closed. And on May 18th, in the same city, two buses arrived at a shopping mall, and people in protective suits got out. It's thought that new cases were found at the shopping mall, so merchants and shoppers there are being tested. One netizen commented, the whole city of Xinyang has fallen to the virus. Everywhere is locked down. The Communist Party never publishes the true number of confirmed cases, just like it never publishes anything about its own corruption. The northeastern city of Shulan is one of the two high-risk areas in China right now. Nobody is allowed to enter the neighborhoods there. On May 20th, local authorities tightened the control measures again. In nine neighborhoods, residents are not even allowed to walk around outside. Now to Beijing, the most important political event in China, the two sessions, will start there on May 21st. Chinese authorities are requiring all attending journalists to get tested for the CCP virus, also known as the novel coronavirus. There's temperature checks at the entrance. News conferences will be conducted via video links. Diplomats hoping to observe sessions must check into a state guest house the night before and be tested for the CCP virus. One particular case in Shanghai has people worried. A lady from Wuhan tested positive for the virus at a Shanghai hospital on May 19th. She arrived in Shanghai eight days before that and used public transport while she was there. She was tested and came back negative before she left Wuhan, so she was given a green health code. One netizen questioned if the test in Wuhan was inaccurate or if she got infected on the way to Shanghai. Many Chinese people know the authorities are under-reporting the figures. So if one case is officially confirmed, people worry the real situation is likely much worse. The lack of transparency results in anxiety and even panic. After Wuhan's plan to test all 11 million residents in 10 days, Taiwan's Minister of Health said China's epidemic situation is much worse than it says. And he says he's worried it's being covered up again. He adds the CCP wants to resume work smoothly and to stabilize the situation during the World Health Assembly. But he's afraid that they're covering up for a second time. He warned Taiwan should still stay alert at all times because China has a habit of cover-ups. The U.S. Treasury Department announced sanctions on a Chinese logistics company for cooperating with blacklisted Iranian Mahan Airlines. According to the press release, Mahan Air transports terrorists and lethal cargo throughout the Middle East. It's also helping Venezuela's Maduro regime revive its energy production by operating charter flights for Iranian technicians and Chinese materials. China's foreign ministry spokesman responded, telling the U.S. to immediately lift its illegal sanctions. Secretary of State Mike Pompeo wrote on Twitter that China is one of the few countries that still welcomes Mahan Air, which is used to ferry Iran's arms and terrorists, adding anyone doing business with Mahan Air runs the risk of sanctions. The U.S. sanctioned Mahan Air in 2011 for providing support to Iran's Islamic Revolutionary Guard Corps, which President Trump designated a terrorist organization last year. 
German media Die Welt wrote on May 17th that the German government has long distrusted information coming from China. The report says it was a mistake for Germany to trust China's virus advice. The German government ignored warnings from its virologists in early February and exported national reserves of protective equipment to Wuhan. It wasn't until the end of February that they realized the virus was also threatening Germany. Tensions continue to rise between China and Australia. Bloomberg reports that Chinese officials are planning to target more Australian exports, including wine and dairy. China has already slapped hefty tariffs on Australian barley and banned meat imports from four slaughterhouses. Australia's Prime Minister Scott Morrison wrote on Twitter saying the country must focus on economic recovery. China is Australia's biggest export partner. Tensions have been rising between the two countries since Australia spearheaded a campaign for an international investigation into the virus origin. Chinese state-run media The Global Times damaged relations further by quoting anonymous netizens calling Australia a giant kangaroo that serves as a dog of the U.S. Some netizens point out the Chinese regime is losing its mind. The Senate passed legislation today to rein in Chinese companies. It would require those listed on American exchanges to comply with U.S. auditing and reporting standards. It's that or they face exclusion. Chinese companies listed in the U.S. aren't held to the same accounting standards as U.S. companies. U.S. regulators can't examine their audit papers because the Chinese Communist Party considers them state secrets. But the new act would boot them off American exchanges if authorities are unable to inspect their audit books for three years in a row. Fraud and accounting malpractice by Chinese companies listed in the U.S. has cost investors billions of dollars. An Australian university is threatening to expel a student and take legal action against him for criticizing the Chinese Communist Party. The 20-year-old's case highlights the Chinese regime's attempts to influence higher education. NTD's Xu Wenrong has the story. The University of Queensland is threatening to expel a student activist for criticizing its relationship with the Chinese Communist Party. An internal email from UQ made public on May 20th shows a member of its communication team asking a UQ deputy vice chancellor to send a statement about pro-Hong Kong protests at the university to the Chinese consulate for review. After a pro-Hong Kong rally on UQ's main campus that UQ undergrad Drew Pavlo helped organize. The 20-year-old philosophy student organized several demonstrations in support of Hong Kong protesters and criticized the Chinese regime's oppression of Uyghurs and Tibetans. Following the protests and Pavlo's criticism of the Chinese regime's human rights abuses and the university's ties to the regime, he was summoned to a disciplinary hearing on May 20th. Pavlo walked out of the hearing after UQ's disciplinary panel refused to provide access to an internal document he had sought for his defense. UQ later published the internal emails after Pavlo gave a press conference questioning UQ's relationship with the Chinese regime. Now people are looking and they're say, saying, wow, this guy... Drew Pavlou, he's a student critic of the Chinese government, and now he's being threatened with expulsion. How could that happen in Australia? Well, we've been setting it up for ourselves for years and years and years, and now it's, now it's clear. It should have been clearer earlier. Concerns about the regime's infiltration of the West have been rising during the pandemic and have brought Pavlou's case international attention. The Chinese regime co-founded Confucius Institutes to spread its influence in overseas universities. The regime says the institutes promote Chinese language and culture, but the CCP has openly admitted the institutes were made for the purpose of spreading their propaganda. UQ's Vice Chancellor Professor Peter Hodge was a senior consultant to Beijing's Global Confucius Institute headquarters, or Hanban, from 2013 to 2018. The Hanban is responsible for more than 500 Confucius Institutes operating in universities and schools across the world. On May 12th, a UQ whistleblower gave Australian Senator James Paterson a copy of last year's senior staff remuneration report. The report shows the vice chancellor received a $130,000 bonus in 2019 from UQ, based partly on his success in growing the university's relationship with China. UQ is now seeking jail time against me as a student because I criticized their relationship to the Chinese government. Last July, Pavlo helped organize a pro-Hong Kong rally on UQ's main campus. 
The rally turned violent when pro-CCP students arrived on the scene. The local Chinese consul general, Xu Jie, issued a statement the following day, describing the event as anti-China separatist activities and praised the counter-protesters for their acts of patriotism. Since then, Pavlo has received hundreds of death threats, including some aimed at his family. At no point really has the university ever really tried to protect me. Pavlo filed a complaint with Xu three months later, saying the consul general played a role in inciting threats and violence against him. He successfully obtained subpoenas addressed to Xu, and a court hearing was scheduled for April 20, 2020. But days before his publicly listed court proceedings, UQ threatened him with expulsion. The institution set out a 186-page document with 11 allegations of misconduct against Pavlo. One of the allegations claims that his online posts bullied, threatened, or abused Confucius Institute staff. Referring to a photo posted on Twitter of Pavlo wearing what looks like an orange biosafety suit in front of the Confucius Institute. He said in the tweet as a student representative, It's my job to keep students safe. That's why I've placed the UQ Confucius Institute under total and complete lockdown until biohazard risk is contained. And a similar post online shows Pavlo in front of the UQ's vice chancellor's office. The allegation states that the messages and signs he posted prejudiced the reputation of the university to the extent that they publicly sought to suggest that the Chinese staff of the Confucius Institute were infected with the COVID-19 virus. Pavlo replied in a tweet that some interpreted the pranks maliciously and that he didn't target anyone's ethnicity. He said, I distinguished the Chinese state from the Chinese people, and I was satirically mocking an arm of the Chinese state for covering up the pandemic in its earliest stages. Pavlo said this is an extraordinary escalation for a public university to take, spending thousands of dollars to silence a student. We're looking towards appealing this outside the university eventually, because I don't believe anything inside the university will be fair or trustworthy. I think they've already made up their decision. They're going to try and expel me. I don't fear. I, I'm not... I'm not scared. I'm going to continue fighting. A petition against Pavlo's expulsion reached more than 35,000 signatures as of the day of his hearing. Reporting by Shirwin Rong, NTD News. A whistleblower is demanding an investigation into the United Nations. She accuses the organization of practices that endanger Chinese human rights activists and their families back home. NTD's Juliet Song has the story. A whistleblower is calling for an investigation into the United Nations. She says in 2013, her boss at the UN Human Rights Office asked her to hand over the names of human rights activists to China. I was shocked that it was even being considered. Um, I mean, honestly, I assumed it would never happen. The scandal comes amid growing global concerns about communist China's increasing influence over UN agencies. Riley says once the Chinese Communist Party has the information, it tries to stop the rights activists from attending UN human rights meetings. People whose names were handed over have reported that their family members were forced to call them to tell them not to attend. Some of their family members were arrested, um, arbitrarily detained, tortured, and in some cases even died in detention. She knows of 20 or 30 such people. Among them is Dokan Isa, president of the World Uyghur Congress, and Geng He, the wife of China's highest profile human rights lawyer, Gao Zhisheng. The UN confirmed to the Chinese mission that both were accredited to attend a 2012 Human Rights Council session. Dokun Isis says his family members are pressured and harassed by Chinese police when he attends UN sessions. In China, more than one million Uyghurs and other Muslim minorities are held in re-education camps. Lawyer Gao Zhisheng has been nominated for Nobel Peace Prizes three times. He's been repeatedly arrested and tortured since 2004. In 2012, when nobody knew where he was, and when the independent UN Working Group in Arbitrary Detention was writing letters to the Chinese government asking to know where he was, and another part of the UN was handing over his wife's name to China and telling them that she planned to attend sessions of the Human Rights Council. The Chinese regime will go to any lengths to prevent activists from attending UN meetings. In 2013, a Chinese human rights defender, Cao Shenli, was arrested at the Beijing airport before a flight to Geneva. She was detained, denied medical care, and died in custody. Riley isn't sure if this activist's name was handed to China, but she said it shows the kind of measures they'll take to stop activists from attending UN human rights meetings.
In 2013, when Riley found out about the practice, she reported to the upper management at the UN. The response she got was, They said that I should trust the political judgment of the person taking it. She said the UN only provides such information to China. Every other member state who asked who would be attending a UN meeting, whether the Human Rights Council or any other meeting, was always told that it's UN policy not to share that information. Riley thinks the UN approached this entirely as a political issue. China wanted this information. China is a powerful member state. In order to not antagonize China, the information would be handed over. In public, the UN denied her accusations. However, in a written response to watchdog group UN Watch, it says the UN Human Rights Office does not confirm the names of individual activists accredited to attend UN Human Rights Council sessions to any state and has not done so since at least 2015. The UN ethics mechanisms actually put in writing that it was unreasonable for me to think that any of those basic principles of the UN Human Rights Office could ever trump the mere possibility of a better political relationship with the Chinese delegation. In an internal document, UN Ethics Office said Riley's case falls into a category called ethics and programming, i.e. an area where OHCHR's senior management had to make difficult choices between building and maintaining a working relationship with member states and its human rights advocacy. Riley warns that human rights activists that go to the UN Human Rights Council need to be aware that their names might be handed over so that they can assess the risk. In blowing the whistle on the practice, Riley took a risk herself. I, I knew that it wouldn't do my career any favors, but I think that if anyone who works in human rights is prioritizing their own comfort and safety over the lives and integrity of human rights defenders, then I think they're probably in the wrong profession. Riley said she was ostracized, defamed, and transferred to a post with no functions. She can't sue the UN because of diplomatic immunity. She can only appeal to the UN's internal court, and will have a closed-door hearing next week. Reporting by Juliet Song, NTD News. Taiwan President Tsai Ing-wen was sworn in for her second and final term on Wednesday in a ceremony at Taiwan's presidential palace in Taipei. Taiwan President Tsai Ing-wen was sworn in for her second and final term on Wednesday, making her message loud and clear that Taiwan strongly rejects China's claims of sovereignty over the island. Both sides have a duty to find a way to coexist over the long term and prevent the intensification of antagonism and differences. I also expect the leader of the other side, China, to take up equal responsibility to stabilize the long-term development of cross-strait relations together. In her speech at Taipei's presidential palace, Tsai said Taiwan could not accept becoming part of China under its one country, two systems offer, which is supposed to guarantee autonomy. But Tsai called for talks with China so that both sides could coexist. Tsai led Taiwan's Democratic Progressive Party to a landslide victory in January, vowing to stand up to China. Recently, Taiwan has also accused China of keeping it out of the World Health Organization. And during her speech, Tsai said Taiwan would continue seeking active participation in international bodies. Over the next four years, we will continue to fight for our participation in international organizations, strengthen mutually beneficial cooperation with our allies, and bolster ties with the United States, Japan, Europe, and other like-minded countries. U.S. Secretary of State Mike Pompeo congratulated Tsai on Tuesday, praising her, quote, courage and vision in leading Taiwan's vibrant democracy. Amid reignited trade tensions between the U.S. and China, the EU's position isn't always clear. Some of its leaders criticize the communist regime, but many try to protect their own economic interests at the same time. Our France correspondent sat down with the director of Paris's Economic Warfare School, who says they're paying a very dangerous game. The Chinese city of Wuhan is not only the origin of the CCP virus, it's also a gateway for French industry. But the global pandemic has forced some French companies to rethink their business dealings with China. French car manufacturer Renault is one of them. It's adjusting its strategy in China by halting part of its production there in April. 
But other companies plan to continue their cooperation with the Chinese regime. Christian Harbelo, director of Paris' Economic Warfare School, says the health crisis presents a chance for French companies to consider whether or not operating inside China is a good strategic move. These French businesses located in China seem to forget that they're under the rule of a communist dictatorship, which is a criminal regime by nature. The rules that govern international trade were largely shaped by the U.S. and Europe. As trade tensions again rise between the U.S. and China, for Europe, doing business with China is also a question of politics. It's still unclear whether the EU will side with the United States and exert its own pressure over the regime. The EU's foreign policy chief, Joseph Borrell, told French media JDD that the EU shouldn't be naive about China. But he added in another interview that his job is to maintain a good relationship with China. According to Harbulo, this position is a very dangerous one. In a recent report published by the Economic Warfare School, Harbulo stated that because China doesn't have the military means necessary to conquer Europe, it targets the economy instead. China tries to bring down Western countries by stealing their technology and weakening their industries. He says European leaders are now at a crossroad. They can choose to side with U.S. and prevent China from subduing Western countries. Or they can choose to continue this game where they criticize China while still trying to protect their own economic interests. This choice would be suicide, I think. Reporting by David Vives, NTD News. A surge of virus cases at the U.S.-Mexico border is putting extra strain on some local hospitals. This comes as the U.S., Canada and Mexico extend border restrictions to fight the pandemic. Two California border hospitals are closing their doors to new virus patients after admitting a surge from Mexico Monday night. Um, we believe they're coming from Mexicali, but they're not Mexican nationals. They're U.S. citizens. They're coming to us because, unfortunately, the, there was an announcement or our understanding is that the hospitals there are not accepting COVID patients. U.S. officials recently warned that an outbreak in Mexico could send a wave of dual citizens over the border. The extra patients could overwhelm American facilities. But the CEO says the two hospitals are still able to take care of patients, and they can take on new patients who don't have the virus. So I want to make sure that you distinguish what we're talking about is very specific for the COVID patients, because we're seeing a rise on the number of COVID positive patients that are actually coming to us from somewhere. And we want to make sure that we don't overwhelm in either one of the hospitals and overwhelm the system with COVID patients to the point that we can't take care of you. On Tuesday, the Department of Homeland Security extended U.S.-Mexico border restrictions until June 22nd. Canada's Prime Minister also announced a 30-day extension on U.S.-Canada border restrictions on Tuesday. Trade between the three countries is allowed, but cross-border traffic will be significantly reduced. The U.S. Labor Department will now conduct closer inspections to see if businesses are complying with CCP virus safety measures. In addition, a virus infection can now be counted as a workplace illness in some cases. The U.S. Department of Labor will expand inspections of CCP virus hazards to include businesses beyond only healthcare facilities. But the policy falls short of demands by worker advocates. The revised policy was issued late Tuesday by the Occupational Safety and Health Administration. OSHA is also requiring businesses to record CCP virus infections as workplace illnesses if the employer can determine the infection occurred at work. OSHA has the power to fine employers for violating workplace safety rules, but only after it conducts inspections and investigations. The revised policies stop short of one of the key demands of unions. They want OSHA to adopt an emergency temporary standard for workplace safety regarding the CCP virus. One union even sued OSHA in an effort to force it to implement the standards. OSHA says the lawsuit interferes with the effort it's making to protect workers. One complaint in the lawsuit was that OSHA leaves decisions on the supply and usage of personal protective equipment up to the employers. A standard would impose requirements on businesses and speed up the enforcement process for companies that don't comply. An advocate describes expanded inspections as too soft a solution. As New Yorkers start to venture out to enjoy good weather, 
One park is drawing circles to help people maintain a safe distance. But be careful. NYPD is still giving out fines for social distancing violations. A park in New York City is encouraging social distancing as more people head outside in warmer weather. The park is using white circles laid out on grass to keep people apart. Domino Park in Brooklyn hosted parkgoers reading, using cell phones, talking and exercising, mostly within circles. So I think the circles are like a creative way to try and encourage social distancing, but when you think about it, no one's going to stay exactly in the circle. People are going to like, I've just been watching people are getting up and running around. The New York City Police Department has been giving out fines of up to $1,000 for flagrant violations of social distancing. Critics say the fines have been unevenly applied. So I think this kind of gives people like, okay, if there's no more circles, then there's no more space at the park to hang out. New York Governor Andrew Cuomo has started reopening areas across the state. And while New York City is still under strict lockdown, Cuomo says he wants residents to have a way to enjoy the upcoming holiday. Memorial Day is coming up. That is an important American tradition. We want to honor our veterans, uh, and we want to make sure that no matter what happens, we are still honoring our veterans. The state will allow ceremonies, local ceremonies of up to 10 people or less. He also said that once a vaccine is developed, he hopes it will be made widely available. I have lost about that amount be, being closed. A band of over 280 small businesses are calling on Governor Cuomo to reopen the state and get New York businesses back to work. They claim they helped flatten the curve and now they are pleading to the governor to reopen because their businesses are hurting. It's getting worse by the hour, not even by the day or by the week. Every hour we're afraid of what's going to be. We don't know how to plan for our fall season. We don't know how to plan. We don't have as much assets or as much you know, as, as the big box stores. We're Governor Cuomo has opened seven regions in the state, but Long Island, Mid-Hudson, and New York City remain closed. A coordinator for a small jewelry store is outraged that big box stores that sell food are able to sell non-essential items like flooring and clothing, but small businesses can't. Are we being played? Are we fighting a pandemic? Or are we just being used as pawns to be played with by our politicians? Why is there a double standard? The group's legal counsel says they are proposing opening their stores while complying with the CDC and the medical guidance from the city and state. They want to prevent their families from going on welfare. They want to prevent their businesses from being eliminated. And everyone has a right to make a living. Everyone has a fundamental human right to be able to make a living on his own behalf. An employee at the children's clothing store says since they know their customers personally, they can make appointments with them. That way, they can abide by social distancing rules while they operate. Kevin Hogan, NTD News, New York. An unusual sight at Michigan's Capitol Lawn today. Hairstylists giving free haircuts to protest the state's lockdown. Michigan's governor says small businesses like salons and barbers may not even be allowed to open next week, and some are fed up. Hairstylists can't cut hair at their shops, so they set up on Michigan's Capitol Lawn Wednesday. They gave free haircuts in defiance of Governor Whitmer's lockdown. They've been sidelined for months. They've been unable to feed their families, support themselves, pay their mortgages, pay for their cars, and unable to make a living. And the governor has not done anything to allow these people to go back to work. And special support for Barbara Carl a shop owner whose haircutting license was suspended after he reopened his business. I knew that regardless of what happened, I was standing on the right side of myself and my creator and you. Even at the protest, hairstylists faced consequences. They were given citations. The state police have been doing their jobs. They've been doing it faithfully. They're good people. They've been given orders from the attorney general to write tickets today to these people. He says they organized Operation Haircut to show support for all service type small businesses like salons, nail shops and massage therapists. Melina Weiskup, NTD News. Michigan's governor says that because of the nature of the business, salons and spas are very unlikely to reopen next week. But bars, restaurants and retailers in Michigan can start letting customers in this Friday. The WHO made a grim announcement today. There's a record number of daily new virus cases worldwide, and France's number of deaths is on the rise again. 
The WHO said over 100,000 new virus cases were recorded in the past 24 hours. That's the most in a single day since the outbreak began. The total number of worldwide cases is approaching 5 million. French authorities reported 110 new virus deaths on Wednesday. That's a slight increase from the day before. It brings France's death toll to over 28,000, the fourth highest in the world. A powerful cyclone tore into eastern India and Bangladesh on Wednesday. Bangladesh has evacuated 2.4 million people to shelters. In eastern India, 650,000 people have been moved to safety. It's too early to estimate a toll on life or damage to property. And around the world, people and businesses are adapting to the virus. A pub in Tokyo has installed a machine that sprays customers with disinfectant as they enter. In Thailand's capital city of Bangkok, a shopping mall installed foot pedals in their elevators for customers to step on instead of pressing the buttons, lowering the risk of exposure to germs. In our business briefings, oil prices surge as demand picks up, but Britain's Rolls-Royce is forced to lay off 9,000 as air travel disappears. Global markets made a breakthrough today as investors bet on a rapid recovery from the virus-induced recession. The Dow Jones Industrial Average rose 369 points, or 1.52 percent, to 24,575. The S&P 500 gained 48.67 points, or 1.67 percent, to 2,971. And the Nasdaq Composite added 190 points, or 2.08 percent, to 9,375. Oil prices climbed 3 to 4 percent on signs of improving demand. U.S. oil rose $1.61 to settle at $33.57 a barrel. Senator Amy Klobuchar wants Uber Eats' proposed takeover of Grubhub to be scrutinized. She raised concern over anti-competitive effects that could hurt consumers. She says a merger of Uber Eats and Grubhub would combine two of the three largest food delivery application providers and raise serious competition issues. Tesla is dropping its lawsuit against California's Alameda County. CEO Elon Musk wanted to resume production, but the county's lockdown orders prevented it. The carmaker stopped production March 23rd, but resumed operations earlier this month, ignoring the state's orders. Britain's Rolls-Royce says it will cut at least 9,000 jobs from its global staff of 52,000 and could close factories. The company supplies engines for a large aircraft and is paid by airlines based on how many hours they fly. That means its earnings will be hit by the collapse in air travel demand, which is expected to last for years. Here at China In Focus, we dedicate ourselves to bringing you truthful, unbiased reporting. Don't forget to subscribe for the latest updates and see you tomorrow.